Thank you. Wow. First off, before I get into my presentation, you guys rock. I just got to say that. The energy that's coming from you is fantastic. Uh, you guys are all seeking knowledge, and that's an incredible thing. So keep on that journey, please. Um, and I, I, he asked about animals. How many of you guys have pets at home? Yeah? So um, if we can get my first slide up, that'd be great. Pets at home, that's, that's a lot of ways, a lot of times, the first time we connect with animals. And, you know, it's a, it's a great experience. Uh, we, we have a, a fundamental connection with, with wildlife. And for me, that connection, I didn't hear anybody yell this, by the way, uh, about their favorite animal, but this is a red-eared slider uh, turtle. And um, that was my first pet. And I kind of get misty-eyed when I look at it. And my, my turtle's name was Myrtle, so you get that Myrtle the turtle. And, you know, I, I got him when I was really young, and I, I, I'm not sure if it was a boy or girl. You know, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes with turtles. Uh, but, but I took care of that animal, and I learned a lot of great things from that. I learned about uh, uh, how to water it. I, I created a habitat for it. I had a little palm tree for it. And that was an incredible experience for me, and I connected with that animal in, in a way that I think only people who have pets and, and love animals can, can understand. And I followed that connection now today where I'm responsible for over 2,000 animals. And we are connected with not only those animals, but animals all around the world. And we get to work with these great, incredible gorillas, uh, not only at the zoo, but I also get to go and see them in Rwanda and places like that. And you know, that, that's an incredible responsibility. And the zoo is an incredible th place that people connect with animal every single day. Um, right there, you see that picture of, of those people feeding that giraffe and connecting with that giraffe, and they are connecting with that animal in a way that's hard to explain in words. And one of those guys might be a future zoo director, you never know. He, I think the little guy down there on the bottom with, whose eyes are looking up, he's really fascinated by that, by that giraffe, and, and people make that connection with those animals, and hopefully what we do with that connection is begin to save wildlife. And uh, zoos and aquariums are an extremely important part of every community. There are 220 aquariums and zoos across the United States and North America. And of that, over 180 million people come to zoos every single year. That is an incredible number. That's more than NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NASCAR, all put together. More people go to zoos than any other thing uh, in any sporting event in the United States all to put together. That's an incredible power. That's an incredible conduit that these zoos uh, uh, provide with the animals and what they do with conservation. And right here at our community, we got an incredible zoo. Uh, the Dallas Zoo. How many of you guys have been to the Dallas Zoo? Yeah, okay. You guys see the Giants of Savannah? Incredible exhibit. These elephants are right there. Uh, we've got a home to five big elephants and they've got an incredible uh, habitat to live in, and, and since we've opened that exhibit, now we're close to a million visitors coming to the zoo every single year. That's incredible. And this last summer, uh, we were voted one of the top 10 zoos in the United States by the USA Today. That's a terrific thing. And, and that's a great, it's a great asset for you guys right here in this community because it's really important. And how many, how, anybody know what this is? A Texas horn lizard, that's right. And when I was about your age, and I, was, I grew up in this area, these guys were everywhere. They were all over the place. Now, have anybody, anybody seen any of these near where they live? Maybe one or two, right? You, they are not in this area hardly at all. And an incredible thing's happening with wildlife. Between, from 1970 to 2010, we've lost almost 52% of our wildlife populations. And that's why a Texas horned lizard, there are areas where they are shrinking all the time. 25% of the mammal species around the world are threatened. 40% of the amphibians are threatened. Um, and and the, those 2,000 animals I was talking about at the Dallas Zoo, 21% of those are threatened animals that we're taking care of. And so not only do we have to take care of the animals that are at our zoo, but we're really, really um, dedicated to uh, trying to save the animals in the wild as well because we want 
future generations of, of you guys and, and even beyond to be able to have those animals, to be able to make them a part of our life and a part of our connection and bond. And so we've got the Wild Earth Conservation Fund at the, at the Dallas Zoo, and we're working with animals all around the world. Uh, we're working with Crimean fling, flamingos in the Yucatan. We're working with Humboldt uh, penguins in Peru. We're working with the Texas horn lizards out in West Texas, the gorillas in Wanda, cheetahs in, in Namibia, and the elephants in Tanzania. We're also working, anybody know what this animal is? Okapi, Okapi that's right. We're working with Okapis in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Congo, but we're also working here. We bred over 30 of these animals and had 30 of these calves. Uh, it, it's in the last 10 years, and that's more than any other zoo in the world. And so that's an important thing to keeping those populations alive. And we, we get back to, I want to get back to this connection because the animals at the zoo serve as that connection. And I didn't bring a banjo today, right? But I did bring a few animals from the zoo. And Candace is with us. We got our, our Wild Encounters program here. And Candace is head of that, and, and Alyssa's here as well. And Candace, you want to talk a little bit about who you have today? Sure. I, with us today, we have Aruba and Bermuda. These are our Caribbean flamingos. And Alyssa has Jasiri in her hands, and that's one of our African penguins that we use. All of these animals are part of our outreach program. So basically what we do every day is come to speak to groups like you about our animals that we help take care of at the zoo. So these Caribbean flamingos, they're, they're obviously they're found in the Caribbean. Uh, we have a conservation program that we do with the Caribbean flamingos. We actually have uh, several keepers that will uh, travel to the Yucatan, and um, they have a breeding area there. And a lot of times when you look at these animals and you're trying to, to look at their population, a good indicator of the population is their breeding area. So we do a banding program with these flamingos, so we know what the population looks like with these Caribbean flamingos. Yeah. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually feeding them, and at the zoo they get a pellet. It almost looks like teeny tiny dog food or cat food, and this pellet contains the nutrients that they'll need to survive. And uh, I think one of the most fascinating things about, about these animals oh, are on, their come pink come colors. They're super excited to see you guys today. Hi. And a lot of us have heard that flamingos get their coloration by the food that they eat, which is true. But a lot of us have also heard that they get the coloration by the shrimp that they eat, which is actually not true. Uh, they actually, they'll sift the water, and in that water they'll actually eat uh, blue-green algae. And funnily enough, that's actually what helps with their pink coloration. Well, with this food that I'm feeding them right now, it doesn't have the algae in it. So we actually have to add that coloration. These guys are actually pretty young flamingos. They're a little over a year old. So they just turned bright pink. When they hatched, they were actually a gray-black color. <laughs> so over here we have Jasiri. And like I said, he's an African penguin. He's about three years old. And Jasiri loves Alyssa. So when Greg was talking about the connection that we make with animals, we take care of these guys every day along with a lot of other animals. And a good example of a connection is Jasiri's relationship with Alyssa. So if you saw him shake his head like that, that's him saying hello. Uh, <laughs> that's his way of communicating with us. Now, African penguins are found on the southern coast of Africa, and a lot of us are very familiar with penguins because we see movies like Happy Feet and March of the Penguins, and we associate them with cold weather. Well, that is true in some cases. We do have cold weather penguins, but we also have warm weather penguins. So, um, like the Humboldt penguins that Greg was mentioning earlier and the African penguins, they're warmer weathered penguins, so they wouldn't survive in Antarctica. The penguins that are in Antarctica are a lot bigger, um, because they need to help to keep warm. So Jazz here, uh, <laughs> that he is found on the southern coast. So you notice that the one, one of the main attributes that we see of penguins are the black and white color. And that actually helps with them camouflaging out in the wild. Uh, when a penguin is swimming in the water, and you think of predators of penguins, if a predator is swimming beneath the penguin and looks up, they're gonna see the white belly, and that white belly actually helps them blend in with the sun reflecting off the top of the water. If a predator is swimming above the penguin and looks down, they're gonna see the dark color on its back, and that actually helps the penguin to blend in with the, the darkness below. 
So penguins mostly are going to be in the water to feed. They like to eat lots and lots of fish. And an issue that we're seeing with penguin populations is uh, overfishing. So we like to eat fish, so do penguins. And that poses a problem because penguins will actually eat a third of their body weight every day. So to sustain themselves, they need to eat tons and tons of fish. So if you're asking ways that you can help, one of the ways that you can help is actually contributing to the zoo. When you guys come out to the zoo, you like to have fun, right? So you buy snacks, you buy souvenirs, you buy all kinds of stuff. Even your admission to the zoo goes, a portion of that goes to conservation programs. Now, even at home, you can do stuff too. We talk about recycling. We talk about, uh, you know, watching pollution and things like that. Uh, one of the things that Alyssa was mentioning or likes to mention with penguins, you think of the Coke rings that you have. Just cutting those so the ring isn't a ring anymore will help not only penguins, but many, many other animals in the ocean because they see that as, as food. Um, and then, you know, we talk about the overfishing with the penguins. One of the ways that you can help with that is the sustainability program with the fish. You can look online and see what types of fish you can eat or that's safe to eat to where you won't actually harm uh, populations of penguins and other animals that do eat lots and lots of fish. You know, and, and that is terrific information, Candace. She, she does a great job getting that out to everybody. And, and at the bottom line of this is, we all connect with the animals and the best way to get connected and do things to help animals is to get involved. We have volunteers at the zoo. We have over 400 volunteers between the ages of 11 and 15. So if you have an interest in it, come to the zoo. That's the way to do it. That's the way to start. There's so many of these people like Candace and Alyssa who have started working at the zoo and are now doing some incredible work. So we want to thank you guys today and, and uh, thanks for coming to TEDx today.